pause that because I don't know how much of that they'll allow, even though that's a cover. Not the original, but I don't think it matters. Believe it or not, I don't have any bourbon in the house. I have no whiskey at all. Absolutely no bourbon. Which blows. If I had any, it would be decent bourbon. That's why I don't have any, because it doesn't last that long. You know. But I don't it's not like I stay stocked up. You know. I do have a, this is a Jack Daniels Tennessee apple. It's okay. It's figure try something different, you know. It's ten percent alcohol, I think. Seven percent. Damn, I read that without any glasses. Seven percent alcohol. And one of these cans, that's enough for me just to knock the edge off at the end of the day. That doesn't mean every day. That just means occasionally it's nice. It's nice to chill. And uh, here we are again. Another, another death. He wants to marking the momentous occasion of another passing of a good soul beyond the realms of this world. You notice I don't make a bunch of videos every time a fitness oriented person passes because it's just an endless and an endless cascading, you know, downpour, really. Regular frog strangler of all these uh, people that are dying. But they, they're, they're spinning that, that wheel of roulette, you know what I mean? They're playing Russian roulette you know, with one in the cylinder. Some get lucky, and you know, some don't. But they know what they're in for. They should, by now, you know. Uh, you're going to make it or break it. And then even if you make it, what, what did you really do? So I don't know. You know, I don't know. I've dropped a bunch of weight myself. I was, you know, I was up to 260s, into the 260s again, well into the 260s. And that's heavy, man. It's heavy. And, and some of my... Close friends were saying, how many other guys you know your age, man, that are walking around 260s, like, lean like that? You know, all veined out and <laughs> fairly hard. I mean, it's, it's not, uh, you know. And, and literally, I know people don't really believe it, but just carrying that weight, and all that muscle and the extensive capillary system that's been developed to have to feed that muscle, supply it with blood and nutrition and oxygen. It's a, it's a lot on your heart, man. And when you got that many miles on you, you're getting up there in age. It's something to consider. Does that mean I won't blow back up again? No. No, because it's my life, just like it's your life, just like it's their lives. You can do whatever you want to do with it, man. Pursue your fucking happiness, for God's sake. What are you waiting for? In this instance, Bob Bonham has passed away. Bob Bonham. Bob Bonham, man, I considered him a good friend. Um, it's not like we saw each other that frequently, but uh, Bob Bonham was the kind of guy that, you know, you ever meet somebody, I'm sure you have. You meet somebody, and it, it, it's a rare thing, but it happens. And as soon as you meet them, it's as if you've known each other forever. You just click. You just mesh, you know. And who knows why. There's just something familiar. That's how it was with Bob Bonham. Bob Bonham owned Strong and Shapely Gym in Rutherford, New Jersey. That gym was huge. 
he literally had placards hanging up that would say like legs. So you knew, you could see the placard that that area is your leg equipment, you know, or chiefly what you would consider leg equipment and so forth and so on. Huge gym. And it seemed damn near that he had like one of everything from every decade, you know, from every decade. He had really old stuff. It was good, solid shit all the way up to, you know, latest and greatest stuff. And when you would go there, there would usually be at least somebody, some photo shoot going on, always, constantly, fitness competitor, bodybuilder, somebody. You know, it was that kind of place. And Bob was, uh, he was, he was um, really adamant about people keeping the place neat. You know, it didn't matter who you were. It didn't matter if you were a complete unknown, you know, 120 pound skinny kid in there with big dreams or aspirations or you just wanted to put some muscle on or if you were just a working stiff, you know, middle aged, just trying to stay fit or if you were a high level pro competitor, it didn't matter. If you left dumbbells laying around or you threw shit around or whatever, Bob would get on that intercom system and, and set you straight real quick, real quick. He didn't tolerate that bullshit, man. But I just, I, I, I just, we just clicked and, and, you know, every time I saw him, he had a smile on his face and he was one of these kind of people that you couldn't be in like a, I don't know, you couldn't be in like a rainy, overcast mood around him because he just brought life with him. He brought happiness around, you know. Um, I saw him, uh. When I was in New York, uh, near Times Square, the theater district right there off of Times Square, the only pro show I ever competed in. And I, yeah, I looked like shit at that show. It was my own doing. Like I said, by then I was already checked out on the competitive bodybuilding thing, but I had already made the commitment to do it. So I was making a half-hearted, half-assed effort and wasn't in shape. Now the show I did before that, is still an amateur in Vegas, I, I looked awesome. Those are all those black and white pictures you see where I'm like super vascular everywhere. That was from that show. You know, when we're in the vendor aisle and my legs are shredded to hell and back, that was that uh, show in Vegas. I was in great shape then. So I kept looking better and better and better and it looked like something big was gonna happen. And, you know, but by the time I got to do the first pro show, I was already burned out on it. I already decided it wasn't for me. I was already checked out. I shouldn't have even done the show, but I did. But anyway, when I first got there to New York, I was, uh, it was like the night before or whatever. And it was early evening and I was walking up, uh, I don't know what the street is, on the side streets uh, toward the theater. And I see across the street, across the heavily trafficked street, I see Bob Bonham and he's like leaning against one of these rolled up doors in front of some closed, you know, look like a garage door with some kind of business or whatever to have these pull down gratings and these doors over him. And he was leaning against the wall and he turned his head and as soon as he saw me, he just lit up, big smile on his face. And when you would see that smile, you know, and see that expression from him, you, you're, you're going to have a smile as brought his canvas on your face because he was just, you know, he just brought that out. That was my experience with Bob Bonham. Um, you know, we would uh, train at his gym very rarely because it was a pretty good ride. But one, one time Jeff McVicker and myself and, and Bob, we were at, uh, we left the gym and went to that local diner right there near the gym that they would go to all the time. And he, we were talking and bullshitting and he said, let me call Greg and see if I can get him to come out. He probably won't because he's not a super sociable guy a lot of times. You know, sometimes he's a homebody. I don't know if he'll come out, but I'll, let me call him and just see if he'll meet us up here. He's talking about Greg Valentino. So he called Greg and Greg didn't come out or whatever. And, you know, that was cool. I think that, I think that Greg is at heart more of an introvert. I think like me. And I think his extroverted self is his public self. And you turn that on, of course, and, you know, be full of charisma and electricity and be the life of the party. 
but I think that really inside, deep down, the real guy, I think he's a, um, more of a, a, a private, um, you know, introverted type of guy. I mean, that's really how I am, you know? But believe it or not, that's really how I actually am at heart. I know you, 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 you know, but it's just you get a certain age, man, and you just, you're, you're, the level of bullshit you can take, you already have, you already have reached the overfill mark. So, you know, yeah, I'm outspoken. I'm, sometimes it's obvious when I'm not happy about something, but, you know, I try to tamper that shit down. But really, the real me, deep down, I'm an introverted type of guy, you know, a private guy. But, uh, you know, and he was just dated, I don't know how many different bikini chicks, fitness chicks, female bodybuilders. You know, that was his thing. He was, uh, he was a ladies' man. Really good guy. And I heard that he was 70 or in his 70s when he just passed. And that's really surprising to me. Time flies. I haven't seen him since, you know, since I was really into bodybuilding. And that would have been, you know, back in the early 2000s. You know, prior to 2010 for sure. But, uh, yeah. what a good dude. Now, apparently he had moved to Florida and he was suffering from dementia and he had it pretty bad. Alzheimer's, whatever. And uh, it's rumored or the speculation that he was also in kidney failure. I don't know about that. I mean, the guy was in his 70s. He didn't look it. He didn't look at it. That, that marks him as uh, better than 10 years older than me, and I never suspected he was that age. Never. You know? I thought we were like the same age. He was very youthful. He was always in shape. Always in shape. Dude was always hard, always lean. But um, supposedly he had mentioned to Dave Palumbo, I believe, maybe Greg as well. They were good friends, but. I think I heard, you know, whatever that's worth, that he mentioned to Dave Palumbo. I know Palumbo put a video up about it. I haven't seen it. I don't frequent YouTube. I'm behind. Bob passed on the 3rd of this month, October, and I just heard about it just now, just a couple minutes ago, prior to this video. But he supposedly, I believe, he told Dave Palumbo, I think, that he was tired of living, he didn't want to live anymore because, you know, he said, when you can't think for yourself, life's not worth living. Something to that effect. And shortly thereafter, like the next day or whatever, he tried to kill himself. He hung himself and he broke his neck. This is what I, what I just read. And they committed him. They took him to some place for an evaluation, a psychiatric evaluation or whatever. I would assume that if you take somebody to a place like that, if that's true, that you have him on watch, but he still managed to succeed, you know, just a couple of days later. So he's, he's gone, took his own life, which, you know, as some people have commented, that's typically you would think of to be a cowardice thing to do, a cowardly thing to do. But in this instance, man, with dementia, if it was bad, I don't know, man. I don't even want to consider what that would be like. I don't even want to imagine what it would be like, you know? I know someone now that I'm very close to who told me that their dad, who I also know, but I haven't seen in decades, that their dad has dementia now and they're taking care of their dad, which is a pretty noble thing to do. And that it occupies most of this person's time because the dad is almost like a child now, you know, he interrupts constantly and, you know, that's got to be like so, such a cruel and undignified way to go, a way to finish out your life, you know. So if Bob did, if it's true, if he took his own life, you know, I hope he gets a pass on that because, you know, that's a lot, that's a, you know, not knowing who you are anymore, not being yourself at all, not being in control of your thoughts. You know, that's, can't imagine how horrible that would be. Horrible. So.
again, you know, uh, death is inevitable for everyone, but I don't say that you should focus on that or, you know, make it into some kind of a paranoid type of fear, but um, I think that you should probably take countermeasures <laughs> in the hopes of staving it off a while. You know, like the L-arginine, maybe you can stave off some dementia if you can keep a good blood flow to your brain. Certainly, you know, the circulatory system that feeds that brain is a lot smaller than those larger arteries that end up getting clogged in some people or damn near it, you know, with uh, plaque and shit. So if they can get clogged up, it's no wonder so many people, you know, have Alzheimer's and dementia and shit nowadays. Anyway, that's it. So I don't have any good bourbon. So I'm toasting Bob with this here. Shitty Jack Daniels, Tennessee apple. And a C note. So that's it. Well, I just wanted to had to mention it. I had to give my testimony about what an awesome guy I think he was, what a good human being I think he was. Um, and the reality is that we all get old, and the reality is that you know some of us might not even get the chance to get that old. Some of us might live longer, but in the end, death is the great equalizer. You know, it's a great equalizer. In many cases, it robs you of all your dignity in the end. It makes strong men into brittle, weak, frail men. It makes uh, intellectuals into, you know, incompetence. And it robs, robs you of your dignity in many instances. Not saying always. Many instances it does. And I've seen that. Great equalizer. Rich man, poor man, movie star, starlet, homeless person, vagrant, recognized as a huge success in the world or um, underestimated and underappreciated. It doesn't make any difference. In the end, you know, Reaper's out there and the Reaper comes for us all. You guys take care. Have an awesome evening.